let's test these mics out. Uh, testing, taste, tasting, testing here. Yeah. Yeah. Try your mic out. Hello. Yeah, check hey, one, two. Got to welcome you all here today. Hope you're doing well and enjoying the festival and the music. Uh, we start these little sessions out on Crossroads um, with a nod and a thank you to the folks who make this possible. And uh, Some of the names are up behind us. Green Family Foundation is uh, pitching in for this and for the Haiti Pavilion, which you see on the other side of the Congo Square. So uh, we encourage you to go and have a, have a look at the Haiti Pavilion. And the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities is also sponsoring these panels. You know, it's a nice place to hang out away from the sun for a little bit, take a break from all the nice music. Um, so we encourage you to come in, sit for the next hour. I have uh, three uh, amazing guys up here on the stage with me. It is an all-guy panel for some reason. This is a boys' day. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm honored to be up on the stage with these with these folks. My name is Gage Averill, uh, and I'm your moderator. Um, we've got the, um, the group Bruce on by them. Uh, Lewis, I'm not Lewis, I'm sorry. Uh, Barnes next to me, uh, Ronald Lewis, and uh, Richard Morris. I'll introduce them when we get started. But we're talking about Carnival today. I just got back from Carnival, and uh, we can talk about our most recent Carnival experiences, too. Mine was uh, this year in uh, Trinidad and Tobago, one of the great Carnivals in the, in the, uh, uh, the Americas, and uh, played Juve, the all-night all Carnival Parade before the Carnival Parade. The daughter played Junior Mass this year for the first time. Often go and play some steel band, um, sometimes uh, judge steel band contests and things like that. But it says, you know, uh, in Trinidad or in Haiti or in New Orleans, there's a season of carnival, right? It builds up to the days before before Lent. This has been hap was happening in Europe since at least the 12th century. Some people trace it all the way back to Roman Lupercalia. I don't. I don't think that makes it that too much historical sense. But it is similarly, you know, it's a kind of festival that that comes at a time of the year when the when the seasons begin to turn over and and the, the world's reborn and human beings want to celebrate. And in the Catholic calendar, right before Lent, people wanted to celebrate, especially because you're about to go into a period of denial, a period when you give things up, eat and drink, and and stuff you might do in the bedroom. So th this was a, a time for people to let loose. Uh, to go into excess, to eat to excess, drink to excess, costume to excess, transform yourselves while the world is transforming itself. Carnival of uh, transformation. And these things pass through the new world where, where liberated blacks, former slaves joined in and transformed these carnivals with, with African ideas and African aesthetics and African instruments and, and, and costuming traditions. Um, one of the great part, these are the great parties of the world. Um, and if you live through it, you know everything's fast, everything's loud, everyone's, you know, caught up. You feel transported, you feel bigger than yourself, right? Anybody, anybody not been in a carnival in this group here? Excellent, okay, we're, we're, we're talking to the converted guys. So I'm gonna ask, um, ask my, uh, my panelists here today, Start out with a little bit about themselves, their relationship to Carnival, the last couple of Carnivals you did, and we'll get the, uh, the conversation rolling. We're gonna talk about the experience of Carnival today, the differences in Carnival and the locations we represent here in New Orleans and Haiti, um, and then, uh, then bring you into the conversation, see if you have comments, criticisms, questions, etc. cetera. So uh, we're gonna start now with, uh, the, uh, with Bruce Sumpai Barnes. Who's the, uh, as you're going to see, got, got some things out here to show you on the stage, but he's the chief of the North South Skull and Bones Gang, right? North Side Skull and Bones Gang. North Side, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Bruce. So, good afternoon, everyone. Good to, good to see you. Yeah, North Side Skull and Bones Gang, that's what I do on, on Mardi Gras Day uh, and the days following up to it. And uh, we are what's known in New Orleans as a Skull and Bone Gang or Skeleton Gang. And this particular gang, and I do have a photograph from a few years ago, and we get them all the time, but this is my gatekeeper right here, Ronald Lewis. But we come out uh, Mardi Gras morning, early in the morning. Uh, we bring the spirits back to the street from the cemetery and turn them loose on the city. 
and we are there to help to remind people about uh, fertility, morality, and all those things that have to do with carnival. Carnival is to us the shedding of the flesh, and that's what we represent in the bare bones kind of way. Uh, so yeah, we you know I, I do some particular things myself on my own. I, I go into cemetery, I round up the spirits and body of them. And when I hit the street that morning, that's what we do. So we're coming out somewhere between five and six o'clock in the morning, and we go door to door in the neighborhood where this gang is from. The Northside Skull and Bone Gang started about 1819 in the Treme neighborhood, about the time that that neighborhood came into conception. And so we go door to door carrying bones, we do sing songs, uh, and we go in houses and we wake people up and joke them into the reality that is Mardi Gras. Uh, some people like it, some love it, some don't like it at all, some are scared to death. And that's good because we embody all of that, the pageantry, uh, the passion of it. Uh, and then at the same time, we remind people that uh, things that you do in life that'll bring about your quick and ultimate demise. Drun drugs, gunplay, domestic violence, all those things. So we talk about that. And uh, you know, some of the songs that we sing are about that exact thing. So we have songs like Ashes to Ashes, Too Late, uh, all these things. And we have a, a prayer song, Northside Skull and Bone song. So we do all these things uh, when we hit the neighborhood. And that's that's uh, what I've done for the last many years. Uh, Big Chief Al Mars passed away last year. He left me in the gang, or with the gang. This is him right here in the middle, and actually, uh, I'll get a chance. You can pass that photo around and out to the audience also. Just on the board, so if he wants to take a look at it. But um, so not to hold it up, that's, that's me. That's me and the gang right there from uh, a few years ago. I'm the guy with that big long blade right there, that, the staff of righteousness. <laughs> so when you see me hit the street with that, uh, best to get out the way. So a lot of people like to associate and confuse us with Mardi Gras Indians. We are a part of that. We, we came along before the Mardi Gras Indians. Uh, we embody the spirit of and bring the spirit of the Indians back to the street as well, but this is something that's much older, actually, in a sense, so that's me in the North Side Skull and Bone. Can you, uh, can you show us the... Uh, sure. This is uh, the kind of, one of the many kinds of heads that we wear. When we come out, I made this about uh, three years ago, so, you know, that's us. We have on the full suit, we have on a butcher's apron, uh, got our gang on there, and when you see me, when I put that thing on, I come out and use sure. it, put this thing on, that's his Mardi Gras day, but. Uh, Alright. Yeah. yeah, so we keep the tradition alive, that's paper mache, bell and wire. Same way it was done almost 200 years ago, using the same, same material, nothing changed same form so there are some other skull and bone gangs around a few of them a lot of them have popped up as a blade seem like it's got a little more popular they don't do exactly what we do and they don't really know all the things we do we're not supposed to we're more like a secret society for sure and uh so that's the kind of head we make we have a very distinctive look that you'll see in that those photographs right there so uh, we do it all you know, you know because it's a uh, a festival with music here I hate to put you on the on the spot, but could you give us a taste of the uh, the songs that the uh, Skull and Bones gang sing? Yeah. So we have a song that we sing when we come out. We are the North Side of Skull and Bone Gang. We come to remind you before you die. You better get your your night together. Next time you see us, too late to cry. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. You better straighten up well before you come see us. You better get your, your life together. Next time you see us, it's too late to cry. Yeah. Yeah. 
called Too Late. Too Late. Y'all gonna help me out with this. It's all yeah. call and response, all right? So the call is Too Late. Too Late. Got it? Too late. late, mama can't help you. Too late, mama rat can't help you. Too late, nana can't help you. Too late, oh the phone gang got you. Too late, where well, you wake up in the morning. Too late, find your own self dead dog. Too late, well the next thing you know, boy. Too late, you're talking dirt on your head. Too late, well the mama can't help you. Too late, phone friend can't help you. Too late, nana can't help you. A sit can't help you. Too late. Well, the bone gang got you. Too late. Up oh, too late, mama now. Too late. Up oh, too late, mama. Too late. Well, it's too late. Too late. Yeah, you run out the door. Too late. I like shotgun Joe. Too late. Hey, you run to the corner. Too late. Sang and do what you wanna. Too late. But when I wake up in the morning. Too late. And I read the news. Too late. They got more under fillo. Boy, it's singing your blues. Too late. Up too late, my mom. Too late. Up too late, mama now. Too late. Head too late, my mom. Too late. Well, it is too late. It's too late. <laughs> we do that in English. Yeah. We do it in Creole. Love that song in Bombay. Yeah. We have songs like that too late. Sometimes I sing it in Creole. Trota, say trota, trota, more and by it, trota, nana by it, trota, oh, trota, say, trota. Okay, Richard, we're gonna have to go on YouTube now. You got some songs? Uh, this is gonna move down. Thank you, by the way, Bruce. That was something really cool. And it's, you know, we're talking a little bit about transformation, but what, what, what? provides the backdrop to the need to regenerate, you know? It's a, it's a constant certainty of death, which is a theme in Carnival, very, very, very deep, you know? Um, now, Ronald Lewis, I, was, I had the pleasure of being on a panel with him yesterday. Yeah, thank you. And the, uh, he's got a, a museum, you all should, can people come visit the museum? Yeah, uh, Monte Giuseppe, uh, 1317 Tupelo in the famous Lower Night Ward of New Orleans. It's the house. Uh, a house of dancers and feathers. feathers. And when we finish it, you can come next door and see my exhibit. He's a member of the Crew de Jew and a, long -term, a lifelong resident, right? Of the yeah. City. Yes, I am. Beautiful. You got, a, got something for us to start out with about, about well, the carnival? Well, really. I'm a, I'm a gatekeeper of the North Side Calling Bomb. This is my honor with Big Chief Bruce on Pine Bomb. And I'm a true New Orleanian. I, I can cover every spectrum of the culture here in New Orleans. From, from being a Mardi Gras Indian, president of the Big Nine Associate Pleasure Club here in New Orleans, uh, member of Crew to Jew, and I'm just a New Orleans enjoying the essence of this life in this city. When when you, when people come here to visit, 25 years later they're still here. You know, and since since Hurricane Katrina, we've had a large influx of new people with new ideas to help move this city forward. And once they see a second line or get a taste of our Mardi Gras, which is a culture that belongs to the people, with the interaction of the people. You know, we have many phases of Mardi Gras. And I always talk about this in my museum. When I say the first phase of Mardi Gras, then when you come from small town USA and you go to the French quarters, you take your clothes off, you get drunk as you can, you get beat by the police, and then you go back to a small town USA and say, I had a great time in New Orleans. Look at the stitches in my head. You know? <laughs> and then you got the other Mardi Gras with, with, with the kings and queens of royalty, Royce Commons and Zulu, hitting you with coconuts and peas and doubloons and stuff. And then you have our Mardi Gras that have the essence of Africa the Caribbean and Latin America, which I always say when those ships came through that passage, when they dropped off all this culture through the islands in Latin America to the great port city of New Orleans. And, and like some cities with culture die off, our culture just continued evolving. I have to say, when, when she said from 1819 up until now, this is how the essence of our culture is. And yes, Mardi Gras is especially special to us. After Hurricane Katrina, 
if we have lost everything in our life, and the, and the big conversation was, we just we gonna have Mardi Gras, you know. So the first thing, second ice club get, came together, gave a big parade, and then that Mardi Gras, I messed with my chief, and that Mardi Gras was more than a Mardi Gras. It was a reunion of the people of the city of New Orleans. Here I am in my skull and bone outfit, standing in front of the Backstreet Museum, and I'm watching all the people hug and cry and kiss, and there I am standing up there crying like a baby, with, with, with tears just running down my eyes through my makeup and everything, feeling the passion and love that the people of the city have for our city and our culture. So th this carnival thing is embedded in our life. Everybody has their own space. And the North Side Scarlet Bone, when I, when I first seen them, I said, this is something I have to be part of. It looked like fun. I don't have to do all that hard sewing anymore and stuff like this. And I asked Chief Al, can I be part of the game? And you know what my chief told me? He said, Ronald, we ain't never had a fat skeleton. I said, well, they had fat people in life. You know? <laughs> so take me as I am. And I'll be the gatekeeper. And I'll be loyal to you as my big chief. And now, as, as I remember him, and when, when Bruce moved up, and I, and I made that same commitment to him, that I'm your gate chief and I'm loyal to you. But as you see, the parade clubs come through here in the street and on the runway. You see the Mardi Gras engine going who now and they and drumming and chanting like they did for well over 100 years. This is the essence of the Lord. This is our comp. This is how I sat on the stage yesterday with a young man from Haiti. And, and we connected the dots of the street parade and everything. And how you say, when the rah rah stop, when they take off up the street, and next thing you know, you're in another city. So that's how I used to be in the early years of Second Line. I would take off with the Second Line, end up in another part of the city, and realize my car was three miles back. <laughs> you know? But this, this is my life. I have my museum, and I have my culture family, and I wouldn't have it no other way. And I really thank y'all for having me on this panel to continue my work that I'm doing for my city and my community. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Now the uh, the third panelist to my to my left is uh, Richard Morris. Richard comes from to us from uh, Port Prince, Haiti, where he's uh, he's got lives a couple different lives. He's got a uh, he's the uh, owner of a, the Olufsen Hotel, one of the, you know the most beautiful, yeah. best known hotels in Haiti. Um, look him up if you ever go. Uh, he also runs, uh, he's the, the director, uh, songwriter, musician, singer with the band Ram, based on the initials, right? Richard A. Morris, <laughs> which is since 1990. <coughs> Excuse me. Been one of the 80s most important and, and, uh, and popular bands. It's a roots music band. And they're here, the drummers are here for Ram. You can catch them at, um, at the Haiti Pavilion. Definitely stop in there, it's an amazing group. And, you're doing a full performance. Okay, the band rest of the band band. comes in next week. And uh, most recently, he's been the uh, advisor to the uh, president-elect. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's amazing that you got time to take time out from that schedule to be here. So Richard, of course. All right, thanks very much. Um, I didn't really understand the relationship between New Orleans and Port-au-Prince and, and New Orleans and Haiti until I, I actually got to, to Haiti. Uh, and, I, and I like to call New Orleans and Haiti twin sisters separated at birth. And birth was 1803 when New Orleans was sold to the United States because Napoleon lost the war in Haiti and he pulled out of the hemisphere. And so, that, so, so this was, um, part of the same French colony and um, and by 1806 uh, the population of New Orleans was 50 percent Haitian diaspora and so our cultures are very similar um, the way we eat the way we think the way we do things is very similar except that um, New Orleans got adopted by the United States and we didn't get adopted by anybody and um, I, 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 I <laughs> <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I'm from a. Uh, 
All right. Right. I'm from a mixed race family. My mother's Haitian, uh, my father's American. I grew up in New England, so I didn't get into, um, into Haitian music, Haitian um, carnival, until I decided to, to move to Haiti to make music with voodoo rhythms. And uh, it took me five years to put the band together. And the first thing we did was do a carnival song. And the, and the musicians would not negotiate that. The first thing we did was we got to do a carnival song. And the point of the carnival song for us as musicians was to send a message. And it was to send a message that would be interpreted by the people to mean something even though the words didn't necessarily seem to be saying it. It was uh, supposed to be a parable. And, uh, and it's the way we, we, we tried to overthrow governments and, and we tried to bring in governments and we tried to overthrow regimes or whatever. But it was, it was be political, but make it seem like you're not political. Um, one of the things that my band did was uh, we took there are two parts of the carnival in Haiti. There's, a, there's the street element, and then there's the float element. The float is the big carnival floats. And, uh, and the street element is like the rah-rah bands or the bon pieds. We don't call them rah-rahs during carnival. We call them bon pieds, the, the band on foot. And, um, and so what, what my band did was we fused uh, the carnival voodoo music with the rah-rah bands. And so it was like we took the street people and we put them on top of the float. And what that did was it made it loud and it made it so everyone had to pay attention to what we were doing. Because they try and, um, they try and overwhelm the people on the street with, with the money of the sound system. And so what we did was we took the street and we put it behind the sound system. And I think that, uh, and I think that was one of the things that we did. We, uh, as I got to know more and more about voodoo, um, to the point where I got initiated, I started to see carnival as um, a different thing. I, carnival is the introduction into Lent. It's the, it's the three days before Ash Wednesday. And so um, it's a religious thing. And so when we had the earthquake, I couldn't understand why they decided to cancel carnival because you don't cancel Easter, you don't cancel Christmas, you don't cancel, uh, you know, St. Valentine's Day because you have an earthquake. You just deal with it in a different way. And, um, and the government that decided to cancel Carnival is now out. And the musicians are now in. They had that same talk after Katrina. Day, so. <laughs> yes. And, and they out. They out. Gone. <laughs> And, and, and my cousin, who was just elected president of Haiti, Michel Matéli, uh, is a musician and an outrageous carnival musician. And I'm one of his advisors. I'm a musician. Not outrageous, but I do my thing. And, uh, and, and so it, it, it's like a message that will, in the future, the people will look back and say, oh, look, they canceled carnival. They threw them out. And they, they elected the musicians. And so um, the important part of Carnival, Carnival starts, you know, on um, uh, Dimash Gla, and it finishes with Easter. It, it's not three days. It finishes with Easter. It, it starts with uh, Dimash Gla, it's uh, Lenzi Gla, Madzi Gla, Ash Wednesday, Kalem, which is Lent, and then uh, Good Friday, uh, Samzi Globeni, and Easter Sunday. And there are other names of different Sundays in between. But even in the voodoo tradition, for instance, in, in Lent, you don't, there are no voodoo ceremonies. There are no, they, they, they close it up. And uh, they close up uh, the temples, and all that stuff gets revived uh, for Easter. And um, so Carnival is, it's an important part of the culture. It's an important part of, um, of the history, and it's an important part of behavior because it gives people, it gives repressed people a chance to talk. It gives repressed people a chance to express themselves. It gives people in the hood a chance to get out and deal with, with death and deal with life and deal with healing. 
and and it's it's what we are it's what we do and it's and you can't erase it it's just it's there forever and it's been there forever we we were born into it we live it and it will exist after we're born and um, you know just picking up on something that, that a couple couple of you have said right now the um, you talked Ronald talked a little bit about the about the, uh, the folks who come to New Orleans to uh, to get drunk, to have a party, right? Get beat up, whatever. That's uh, on uh, Bourbon Street. You were talking about this difference between people out there on the street versus folks on top of the shard. You both, uh, a couple of you talked about the spiritual dimensions of carnival. You know, life and death. Uh, Wooden spirituality. What's what's at the? I mean, we know the carnival's going in a lot of directions, right? There's, there's tourist carnivals, there's spectator carnivals, there's carnivals in the community. What's at the core of all this for each of you guys? What's the kind of, like, the center of carnival for you and the piece that shouldn't change? Can I say this? Now, when, when the Mardi Gras in New Orleans was started by the French, nobody was invited to their party. So us who were excluded, we created our Mardi Gras. We created it with the Mardi Gras Indians, skull and bone, the baby doll, and the Mardi Gras maskers. And as those visitors come and see all this influence, they, they can connect to the various places that they're from. Even all the way up to Philadelphia, we got a group called the Mummers up there. And, and they, they have visited my museum, and they have connected their dots up there in Philadelphia and stuff. And, for Mardi Gras, you know, just like with everything else, it's the spirit of the people. And no matter what it is, the spirit cannot be denied. And this is what we are, the spirit of the people through earthquakes, hurricanes, all type of disasters, but, but, but besides the life that, that we live or survive. And, and this is uh, what's so culminating about the carnival thing. Mardi Gras is also money, you know? Mardi Gras, is, it's like Christmas. It's, uh, people are, this is a time for the little market lady to come out and sell her beers on the street. It's a time for the woman to sell grilled chicken on the street. It's a time for the carpenters to be building the floats. It's a time for the people who are making these masks to be making masks and selling masks. There's a, there's a, there's an economy to it. And it's an economy that some people need it for, to, to, to survive the rest of the year. Yeah. And so, so there's the spiritual element, there's the revelry element, there's the tourist element, there's the, the initiate, uh, spiritual element. All these things are coming together and that's what makes it life. It's a part of life. It's, it's a reflection of life. Yeah, for, for me, uh, uh, I look at it as a, uh, it's the equalizer. It's the day when no matter who you are, how much money you have or don't have, uh, there's one thing you can do on Mardi Gras and that's be anything you want to be. That's a day for masking. You can be anything but yourself. <laughs> and that's what people do. So, and we have other equalizers also, but in this city as well as in places like in, in Haiti, the, the people realize that uh, you can beat them down as much as you want. Uh, people were enslaved, they were chained. Uh, you got my body, but you won't get my soul and my spirit. Uh, you can't own me, I'm gonna own you when I want to. And so the equalizer is when people take the street, they do anything, so they're gonna go into their farthest reach and imagination to say, here's who I really am. This is what I wanted to do, so. That's what people do on, on Mardi Gras Day and in the carnival tradition, you know, the days leading up to it. Just like the carnival in Haiti really starts on Dimanche Gras. For us, it, it's going to start the first Sunday after the new year, leading up to Mardi Gras Day. Sure, yes, also with us, the pre-carnival. Yeah, and pre carnival uh, after, after Le Wa, after the 6th of January. Yes, yeah. the Janet King Day. So, same thing, but yeah, it's a great equalizer also. So that's something that says, um, the same thing that we have with second line bands and rah-rah bands. It, it is a, a, a procession, it's a liberation. Uh, and it says that anybody can join this and you don't have to have 
the money or anything. We're gonna take the street, and there's nothing that anybody can do about this. Police, mayors, kings, queens, this is ours. We own the street. So that's where people go and they dance and they leave it right there. They're gonna leave it on the ground. That's why we have 45 Sundays a year of street parades here. Minimum, because we have so many benevolent societies and social aid pleasure clubs. 45 Sundays, did you realize that? You can live on St. Charles Avenue and not know anything about it except for during Jazz Fest. Never see it. Two blocks away is the most impoverished part of the city. Always has been. Central City is the poorest part of the city. This has never changed because this is really where most of them enslaved people, as soon as emancipation took place, they moved into Central City by the tens and the thousands. And they parade in there like there's no tomorrow. They do it all over the city, but particularly in Central City, when you're as close to the richest people in this city, there's some rich people in this town, let me tell you. They live right on St. Charles Avenue, three blocks in is Central City. And that's where the parading goes on, that kind of tradition has always been there. There's no separation, so that equalizer uh, is the thing that happens there. You can't buy it, you can't sell it. All you can do is get in the street and have it. You know, you, you, you mentioned rich, rich and poor, and the, uh, so I want to play with this a little bit. Because some, in some countries, if they're carnival countries, people say, oh, this is the moment when everybody's together, right? Rich and poor playing in, in the streets. But, you know, I, I go out there and sometimes I see rich people in stands, poor people in the streets. Can you talk a little bit about the dynamics, class dynamics in, uh, in carnival? Well, it's bringing everyone together. I mean, everyone's together. Um, uh, yes, the stands, uh, I haven't seen the New Orleans Carnival, but the stands in Port-au-Prince, uh, it's costlier. Sometimes you have to pay to get in. Uh, sometimes you have to be part of a company that's, that's building a stand. You have to get tickets or you have to be invited. Um, some people in the stands like to go spend time in the street. The street is definitely um, the masses, the Haitian masses. Um, the floats are the most expensive things going down at Carnival. A float can go anywhere from 200 to 350, 400 thousand dollars US to build a float and to put the sound system and to so 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 that's the the biggest show of muscle is on the float. And if you can get on a float, I mean that's a big deal. And people are getting doing whatever they can, whether it's the band that's getting on or whether you're a technician that's getting on. Um, but those are the different parts. And people, rich and poor, are trying to go back and forth between the street because there's a vibe that you're gonna get on the street, you're not gonna get on the float, and you're not gonna get it on the stand. And there's a vibe you get on the stand where you're getting the, the free beers or whatever, and so you spend some time on the stand trying to get some beers and you're trying to get some meals, and then you head back down to the street. So different people are doing different things. Um, it's a... Uh, there is an underlying economic factor in it, and yes, it's a bit, it's a bit covered up by the masks. But um, for instance, people will say uh, if they want to overthrow a government, we're going to do this after carnival. <laughs> if we're not happy with the government, we're going to enjoy your carnival. You're going to spend the money in carnival, and then we'll deal with you after carnival. <laughs> so, um, uh, same thing here. You know, it's, it, just as he said, I mean, you know, double first cousins, twin sisters in New Orleans and, and Haiti, especially the southern part, places like Jacques Mel, when you go there, it's so self-evident that, you know, this is what it is. You know, the first time I went there a couple of years ago, I played the, the music festival there in Jacques Mel, and it was stunning uh, just to see how, how much it looked like New Orleans and um, that the guys from Ram and, all, you know, a bunch of my favorite groups and uh, sounds very similar. The music is, is also really similar. I had a chance to uh, had T. Copa come and play on my set yesterday in the Jazz Fest here on the Blues Tent. I was playing with the accordion player. We're playing a bunch of songs that, you know, essentially sound the same, but Louisiana Creole music and Haitian folk music is not, not much separation. Same rhythm, same qualities, everything. So, and this is the same politics as well. Uh, so, and that's easy to figure out because the cities were set up by the same system. And guess what? They still run the same way. People here like to think that, oh, we're far removed from this or that. But New Orleans is the, 
the only remaining uh, colonial <laughs> city in, in the U.S. Uh, so there's, there's no real separation. It took a whole lot to try to uproot the system here and turn this into an American town. And it never really happened. But, you know, that's, that's the beauty of having that. And when you see the carnival and the music like that, I, I tried a bunch of years ago to have them do this with Haiti. It almost worked, but the government flipped there. Uh, and then we almost didn't have it this time either because uh, we were on a continuing resolution with the federal government a few weeks ago. Had they not, if they hadn't voted and, and passed that, that short-term budget um, three weeks ago, none of these musicians would have been here other than ones that came from New York. Uh, and that's, that's how things are. You can't get a passport, you can't get a work visa. None of those things would have happened and shut the government down just for a few days to show a political uh, standpoint. You've done it. <laughs> so. yeah, like for me, you know, the, the, you know, you still got this contingent in, in New Orleans who still think that the South's going to rise again. They, they drink the mint julep, they wear the seal sucker suits, and, and they have their pretty young ladies in Galatoire's or one of them. On, on, on a Friday and they do this social thing. And what then happened here in New Orleans that two gen generations or three generations down, now here are they grandkids found the second line in New Orleans. That same taboo thing that they told them not to. You know, in my museum, it, it became like a cool, true confession place of, of New Orleanians who come in there and say, Oh, I didn't know that they had a museum in the Ninth Ward. And I come from Old Mallory. I come out the Garden District. And I think, and I tell them, I say, you know what? That same lady that fed y'all with your children, cleaned your houses, and then came out the little Ninth Ward, it's you the home woman. Y'all just didn't care to find out about that. But, you know, by these, these elitists, thinking that it's just their world. The rest of the world is passing them by. Several weeks ago, they had a club called the Young Men Olympia that, that were parading. And behind the second division were two-thirds Caucasian people. And I said, now, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have seen this. You know, but awareness, education, is drawing them out the woodwork to say, we are New Orleanians now, and not just Elitist could that come from the elitist family and and in the social aspect we're gradually taking down those small barriers. You know, it's still a lot to go, but uh through the Katrina thing, we turn the city around through through the culture, through the understanding of each other. And having the opportunity to be on this stage today with, with these fine gentlemen, you know, to continue putting out that message that we're going to make this city a great city that it's supposed to be. And not what they say in the past about it being a great city, but it wasn't a great city for everyone. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm uh, sitting on the stage with three guys who, who um, are out there every year in Carnival. You know, Richard's writing songs, his band is playing Carnival. These guys are parading. Uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of experience, a lot of uh, uh, the philosophical depth about Carnival on this stage. So I wanted to see what you all have to say, uh, what, what questions you might have for these guys, uh, comments on what's been said. I got I can I can move this around a little bit, so I'll uh, I'll pull it on out for you. Hello, uh, my family is from Haiti. My mom lives in Port-au-Prince now, and um, I moved to New Orleans from New York. Uh, in August, and I went to my first second line. It's been interesting because I've been uncovering a lot of the traditions that are the same, and I'm thinking, why am I here? But <laughs> um, but the first second line I went to was the Black Men of Labor second line that goes, I think it goes down St. Claude, and then into the Treme, and then it goes on Claiborne. And I remember that day, I was you know, hanging out with a bunch of people, and we were having a good time, and I thought, wow, this is so crazy. All, all kinds of people are out here. And then as soon as we turned on the Claiborne, I started feeling, this is not safe. 
And I turned to my, I tu- and as soon as that thought popped into my head, this woman said to me, um, you know, don't be, this is where the guns come out, don't be surprised if you hear gunshots or whatever. And so I, wanna, I wanted to ask you, as leaders in your communities, how do you deal with that mentality or accept that violence happens? Because it's something that I think that we need to talk about. Well, um, I was in that parade. I was developing one with that, uh, with the purple shoes on and the hat. No, yeah, that's, um, this past year, uh, yeah, the black men in labor, what you need to know about a, a street procession and a parade uh, is that nobody in a parade picks up the phone and calls and says, that's a part of the organization Let's get some guns shooting here today. That's not what happens. Uh, just what he was saying, and you weren't here for that part, but when he was talking about political process, this is uh, street processions draw certain things. We have an uh, organization that is dedicated to nonviolence, the education, and putting a traditional New Orleans parade on the street. We play a certain kind of music. We don't play any modern brass band music either. Not that we don't love it, but we uphold the traditional music of New Orleans. So when we come out and we parade, that's all we come to do, to try to have a beautiful day. We pray for no violence. We pray to go and have a good day. This past year, something did happen. It was the first time that anything ever came close to the Black Men and Labor Parade. Uh, and most people never come around that because, I'm gonna say that the people who are associated with and become a part of violent things because we don't do what interests them because we're playing old school music and we're doing all those things in that way. But of course, nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to see it. Um, we have a police detail. Um, people like to attach, and they have in the past, uh, people who write articles, people who think at it, they think it's the actual organization. Well, that's gonna bring some violence. No, that's not what it is. Uh, because you look at all the other violence that's going on in this city, you have close to 350 murders a year here. Uh, most of it never happens around a parade. I'm not gonna say it, it, it might not happen in association with one of them, or unfortunate winner, but that's when people play their beefs out. They wanna do it on the street, they do it in front of the police to make a point. It's ignorant, but they do it, they will do it on the street. They'll do it in front of police, but they'll do it in lots of places. That's, that's where the education part comes in the dialogue to understand that um, you can't take bad apples and toss them into every scenario. So. I wanted to add that my mom would definitely not approve of me going to a parade during Carnival or any other. I said I wanted to add that my mother would definitely not approve of me going to a parade in Haiti. And I, and I agree and because you seem like a very fine young lady. <laughs> yeah. But while she doesn't agree, that you go out, it's because she knows what happens because she was in one too. Right, that's the time. But can I say this? Now, you have hundreds of people that come out to our street parade. I'm the president of the Big Nine Social Pleasure Club. And I always think on that, bottomless thing when the question come up is out of 100%, that 2%, that leaves their home with them guns and thing on them, they don't love the city, the culture, or themselves anyhow. So when they create this chaos, you know, it, it's not a, a referendum of the people. And, and by that 2% over challenge with the other 98% do, then this is how they stigmatize us. So, oh, I don't go to them second lines and all this kind of stuff, but let somebody get married in their family as soon as the reception hall opened up the door, he will get why I got a gown up like this, got an umbrella in his hand, and you can't get him off the ground. You know, because it's embedded in our life, it's our way of life. And, you know, we adjust, we speak out. You know, when they show you a parade route, they always say, leave your trouble, your power, your problems, and your guns at home. Because we do not indulge that. We try to be, to stand the barriers of, of our communities and ensuring that, especially for black men here in the city of New Orleans, that we do have character 
and clear us about ourselves. And we do love our family and our children in our community. It's true, and we spend a lot of money on, on details. Five, six thousand dollars for a police detail. And when the report comes out in the news, it might say, this happened at this parade. On, so they put it on the shoulders of the actual organization when that's not, that's not what happened. You got 10 cops on the street. They're gonna do it anyway. It happened at Rex and Collins too. Sure, you know, it happened on St. Charles yeah, Avenue. When you have hundreds of people together, you know, and just some they have bad intent, but life goes on. Right. Not so, gonna be held on hostages to those people. My big mama used to tell me, hey, say your prayers every day. You, you know, you can only do what you can do. You can be aware. Uh, you should never be, able to walk, be afraid to go through the streets of the city. Uh, that doesn't matter about race, color, sexual origin, anything. Uh, the whole creed, be okay with it. Be aware of where you're at, uh, but you have to be okay with yourself. And surely it's all this stuff and people worry about this. We're fighting three wars on three fronts. I think we got some violence here. It's not like that. There's a whole lot that goes into it, but I understand what you're saying. You if have it, to listen to your mom. If it helps with your mom. Yeah, I know. If it helps with your mom, I was just in um, in, uh, Port, in uh, Port of Spain, in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, for Carnival, with my mother-in-law, and uh, all of her sisters and brothers. She's 72, and she, she couldn't stop chipping. I mean, it's been about 20 years since she's played mass. She was the whole time, and uh, she's going back next year. She can't, we can't wait. She's gonna, she's gonna uh, join a mass camp and play, uh, play carnival next year. So I'll be there with my mother-in-law. Anyway. Uh, next question, yeah, back here, Lisa. Hi, I wanna go back to the politics um, behind carnival um, and, and really ask you if you think this tension that exists between carnival, the people who are parading, and the establishment is a necessary component. To me, it seems like Carnival would not be any fun or wouldn't be the same if that tension didn't exist. Um, and we know there are varying degrees of tension, so I'm not talking about, you know, the government trying to come after you and hurt you, but I am talking about this tension that seems like a key component. And I'm wondering if you agree, and, and if so, um, why? Why well, is it important? I think, um, for example, I think Carnival's better now that we don't have enslaved people in an institutionalized way in this country. We had Carnival before then. We'll have it now. A lot of what you see is the people's voice from oppression, but I don't think people need to be whooped on their head to go out and do, have a good Carnival. Uh, I think that people would express themselves even more freely if they had more money, if they had more uh, education, if they had more luxury time. Not everyone has the same time. Usually what people are talking to, a lot of what we're talking about is the people who have very, very little in some ways to express themselves, but they manifest it because they put their whole mind, body, and soul into it, and they're doing it themselves. They're not hiring somebody else to go out and do that. I can't get nobody coming to my house and do this. I can't get nobody in my house to help me with this. <laughs> I mean, me to look at it, it's interesting, but <laughs> but that's the nature of it. But I'm, I'm, I am doing it on the cheap, I'm using some Times Picayunes. I use it, but I always put the Louisiana Weekly in there too. And uh, you know, I, I pick out the right kind of paper to put in there. Yes, and then I'm using some. 16 gauge bailing wire and, and flour. I'm done with low pain. But, but if I had more time and stuff like that, more money, I might do something fantabulous. There's, um, if I put out a carnival song, maybe 10 million people are going to hear it. Right. So, if I have a chance to speak to 10 million people, then I have a responsibility to, to say something that will um, be a positive influence in, in their lives. 
uh, I have to do it in a way that it's enjoyable because they have to enjoy it. They have to dance to it. They have to sing it. But if I can, um, if I can be profound in a way that I can address some injustices and I can address uh, some political problems or I can address some uh, cultural um, important uh, moments, uh, then, then I have that sort of responsibility. Um, but, but it has to be in a way that people can enjoy it. So, so it can't just be, I'm gonna get heavy with you because I have to teach you something. It, it can't be like that. It has to be enjoyable, but if, but if you're gonna speak to 10 million people and you can pass a message, then, then that's a good thing. And, and, and sometimes that message is overtly political. And sometimes that, uh, I mean, we, did, we got hit by four hurricanes uh, in 10 days uh, back in 2009. And so I did a, a, a carnival and I created this woman called Madame Letan, Mrs. Weather. And uh, what are you doing to me, Mrs. Weather? You took my cow, you took my house, you took my mother, you took my father. And so, so it was kind of humorous, but people sing it and because it was devastating. I mean, uh, it wasn't as devastating as the earthquake that happened the next year. But, but when we sang that song after the earthquake, it, 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 it did what it needed to do. It helped people get rid of uh, the emotion that they have inside, the hurt, the pain. It helps them sing it out of their systems. And so, uh, so, so it's a function that we have uh, in a relationship that we have with, with the crowd um, and with the people and with ourselves. And we have to be in tune with them. And, and often that tune is injustice. And often that injustice is political. Uh, yeah, I, I heard you singing a song earlier. I heard you singing a song earlier uh, in, in Creole, like in French, New Orleans Creole. And I, I was wondering, like, to what extent is Creole language still alive in New Orleans? Is it just in the song? Do you speak it fluently? Did your parents, your grandparents? I'm just wondering how, how is it used in, in New Orleans today? Uh, there's not that much Louisiana Creole in New Orleans. Uh, there are some older people here in the city, mostly in the Seventh Ward, because that's the center of Creole culture here in New Orleans. Uh, but most of the Creole speaking people are out in the countryside. So um, most of my songs come to me in dreams. So I just take it as it comes, don't question it. Uh, but if I'm going to sing it or perform it, or if it's something I think I need to have to record, I put it out there. So I don't ever question it. And I was born in Arkansas, Mississippi Delta, and uh, moved to New Orleans in 1987. And that's it. So I mean, I, I learned it on the fly. I used to have lots of dreams, and I was speaking Creole in my dreams. Didn't really know what it was, but I know now. When you came to New Orleans, people were speaking Creole. There's some people in New Orleans speaking Creole, not 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 large numbers, as I said. Most of the Creole speaking people out in southwest Louisiana uh, and in the surrounding area, southeastern Louisiana. The Creole language here, Louisiana Creole, is right at the top of the list for endangered, almost extinct languages. So uh, it's a little different than Haitian Creole, but it's not that much different. I'm, you know, Martinique Creole, Saint Lucia Creole from. Yeah, and places like that, but um, yeah, really the first songs that came to me in dreams was, I used to have these dreams, I had a song called Mo Bien Como Ye. So, on prend ça, Mo Bien Como Ye. Yes, uh, my, my friend, how are you, uh, Mo Bien? Uh, yeah, Mo Bien Como Ye, so that was a song that came to me. Et lui, il m'a dit, c'est qui j'en ouye? Oui, c'est, comment t'y es? Comment ça fait coulis? So this song came to me in dreams, and that's, but the language also, I, that's not easy to explain, but I, I had lots of dreams in, in Creole. I didn't really know the language until I came into this city, in this area, and I was like, oh. And I, uh, and when I, I went to Haiti the first time, it was the same thing. I speak New Orleans, <laughs> you know, and they say, well, what that you say? I say, I'm well, a New Orleans. Yeah, like, we take words. Yeah, that that's in the American language and, and it ends up being four or five different words. 
Yeah, yeah most of a lot of uh, New Orleans vernacular is just <laughs> translated directly from Creole into English. So that's where you get all of that, uh, who that and what that is, and all, uh, all those things are just like translated directly from Creole into English over time. Yeah. Greg, now for, uh, I want to thank, yo, we have one last question and we got to wrap up. Sorry if this is a little redundant because I came in late, I'm afraid, but um, where I live up in the Boston area, there seem to be way more Haitians and more Haitian Creole, uh, you know, Creole, than here in New Orleans. Anybody, am I right in, that, in having that impression? And why would that be? There's a lot of Haitians in New Orleans. A bunch of them. You may not see them, but there are a lot of Haitians in New Orleans, actually. Uh, they spread out. Uh, but. There's lots of them. Uh, before the storm, there was a lot. I'd say there was probably easily, well, I'm not gonna say a lot, but probably 10 to 15,000 people here in this city. Yeah. Um, the city's laid out a different kind of landscape than some people realize. Uh, so, but we're talking about New Orleans in a historical way when people came here as opposed to now and where people are going in a constant migration into different parts of the and it's mostly up the eastern seaboard. Oh, it's just catch a cab in New Orleans. You, you, you'll find out how strong the Haitian community have evolved in this city in most recent time, more visible. Sir, buddy, I want to thank you all for coming out. I know it's, uh, you got a lot of choices. Yeah. Thank the panelists here. Bruce, Donald, Richard. Uh, a lot going on here. It's, it's really cool to have you all sit down and uh, learn together for a little bit. I want to remind you that there are a couple of panels coming up this afternoon. In 15 minutes, Haiti and the music of Congo Square, and at 4 o'clock, Meeting Traditions. So come on back if you feel like taking the set. And uh, thanks, y'all. <laughs>